So from the one person speaking, we're moving into more conversational form as we will be, grow more and more conversational as the day goes along. And uh, in order to make this shift, we've invited our co-sponsor for this event, who is actually a specialist in conversations that have meaning. And that's David Freudberg, who um, he and I have been in conversation for a couple of years now about chaplaincy. And um, he came to me with a question a few years ago. And he wasn't just asking me, but he was asking a number of people, is there a chaplaincy podcast out there? And um, not only did I not know for sure what the answer was, I um, needed to do that U-turn of compassion to myself because the question hadn't occurred to me. <laughs> so as I was trying to answer, I thought, why didn't that occur to me? So David is not only a, a specialist in conversation, but as he listens, he listens not just for what people are saying and doing, but what's not being said or what conversation is not happening and knows how to begin making those conversations happen. And so I'm really grateful, David, for your co-sponsorship for this event, for your moving forward with the Spiritual Care Podcast, which I'll turn over to you to tell them more about. I won't uh, spoil the punchline on that. But uh, you may know David also as the producer of Humankind, which is a wonderful podcast that has been available on WGBH. And so I'm going to let David introduce um, the two partners in this ongoing conversation. So I'm just going to turn it over to you now, David. Thank you. So I'm the host of Humankind, which is a public radio program distributed by NPR. And in the course of a project we completed a little over a year ago called The Power of Nonviolence, I kept bumping into the most interesting people in very different places from prisons to hospitals to places who were treating veterans for PTSD, and they identified themselves as chaplains. And I started to think, there's something here. And I would like to know more about chaplaincy, and I wanted to investigate that, and the Henry Luce Foundation, and shortly the Carpenter Foundation uh, have supplied us with some resources to make possible this new project that we launched in January of this year that is described in one of the brochures of your packet, which is called the Spiritual Care Podcast. And we are up and running. You can subscribe, uh, as David will beg me to ask you to do, and to rate and review at iTunes, which turns out to be the most effective way to get other people aware of it. Uh, and of course, it's free. And uh, you can listen to a number of half-hour stories that we've told and that we're continuing to tell. And some of the folks in the room are actually some of the stars of those shows. Um, and uh, I, that's how this project came about. So let me um, first uh, play you uh, a brief description of the spiritual care podcast project which has sponsored our event today. Hi, I'm David Freudberg from Humankind Public Radio. We're excited to announce a new project, the Spiritual Care Podcast. You know, I'm privy to people's great secrets. I'm privy to, to people's great hopes and great dreams. People share with you their secrets oh, on their deathbed. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Things they wish they had done differently or been different or things that they cannot believe happened to them. And we don't have many opportunities in our society to hear those stories. And yet we all carry them. We all carry You'll hear them. stories of caregivers who take an approach that is inclusive, not exclusive. People willing to genuinely listen and to offer spiritual support to folks wrestling with a wide variety of life questions. I do believe that beyond just tolerating other people's views and other people's experiences, we can find a way to relate to them and to respect them for what they are and to embrace them in a sense and, and see them on equal faith, footing. Because maybe there's an idea that faith is a certainty all the time. Um, I happen to believe that faith is moving forward in, in the midst of your uncertainties and in the midst of the uh, unknown and your doubts. What was it like to be a spiritual presence in a war zone? 
Well, it was a a gift on the one hand, um, and I guess in the same gift there was um, beauty and tragedy. I found beauty in the encounter of human beings and all their strengths and weaknesses. Join us for the Spiritual Care Podcast. Please subscribe, rate, and review. You can find us at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you find your podcasts. And that now includes uh, the platform called NPR One, which is uh, increasingly popular. So um, we are recording this uh, conversation today for use in uh, a future episode of our podcast. And I have a couple of really spectacular Boy, it's kind of dramatic how that goes up. <laughs> Spectacular uh, guests uh, who have kindly flown in from the West. Um, and uh, immediately to my right is Rabbi Patricia Carlin Newman. She is Senior Associate Dean for Religious Life at Stanford University, where she teaches courses including spirituality and non nonviolent social transformation, and lectures on rabbinical ethics, Jewish Feminism, and the Relationship Between Religion and Education. Welcome and thank you. And also with us today is Sensei Joshin Burns, who serves as Vice Abbot of the renowned Upaya Institute and Zen Center that's in Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, with a mission that focuses on integrating practice and social service based on wisdom and compassion. They work in death and dying, the environment, prison service, and other areas. All very noble and inspiring pursuits, and hopefully we can learn from them today. Um, let me begin with Rabbi Carlin Newman. Uh, at a time when women rabbis were quite rare, you decided to become a rabbi partly on the suggestion of an Irish Catholic philosophy professor. <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about your background? Thank you, Kevin O'Neill. <laughs> I was raised in New York. I was the second child. The apartment in Brooklyn was too small, and so my family moved to Long Island. And my parents joined the synagogue because they thought it would be a good place for social connections. And I convinced them in fourth grade that between baton twirling and ballet, <laughs> I didn't have time for religious school. So I dropped out, and <laughs> when I was 15, I was thinking about this as Frank was speaking about those lodestar moments. When I was 15, my grandfather was ill and died in our home, and the rabbi of the congregation was very present. And we started talking about issues of meaning and social justice, and he invited me to participate in a post-confirmation class, even though I had not gone through bat mitzvah uh, confirmation. Uh, I did that. I then went to something called Jifti Mitzvah Corps, which was a summer program where a group of students lived with a rabbinic student and his wife and did work in the community and lived in a fraternity house at Rutgers. And uh, while I was there, I became interested in nonviolence and first worked came here, I went to Simmons College uh, locally, and I was in an experimental program. While I was there, I worked at the American Friends Service Committee and became very interested in why it was that all of the people I was meeting in the Quaker organization were Jews. <laughs> and so I started exploring Judaism then transferred to Johnston College in Southern California, where I majored in nonviolent social change. It was an experimental college where people created their own majors. And while I was there, found myself trying to figure out how to put together my various interests and had a conversation with a number of the faculty members I was close to. And when I spoke with Kevin, he said, what are you interested in? I said, the relationship between individual and community, how to make the world a better place, meaning. 
and he twirled around in his swivel chair, put on a fake brogue, he was from Long Island too, and said, become a rabbi. And I laughed because this was 1975 and there was one woman ordained. But uh, I pursued it and discovered that there were people who had expertise that interested me and much to my surprise, they took someone who had very little Jewish experience except for this summer program and post-confirmation class. And uh, I started in rabbinical school and found mentors along the way and um, feel very, very fortunate to have had that suggestion. And since then, briefly, you've led a grief and bereavement support group for 20 years after the tragic death of your brother. Uh, what's that experience been like for you? Um, the grief group has been one of the ways that despite the wide range of experiences, traditions, cultures, students at Stanford find their common humanity. So I, I need to uh, correct, it's not my brother who had died. I see. It's a story about a student who had come to Stanford after a summer in which her brother had been killed in a car accident, actually, actually a taxi accident in New York City. And she was a young woman who became a regular in this group, along with another young woman whose sister had been murdered. And uh, there was an opportunity for people to be present for one another and I facilitate this group and regard it as a tremendous privilege to help people to make the space to be in a completely different reality than the one that their academic world usually elicits. So it's, I, I lost both my parents very young, so mm. I came to understand how important it is to have someone present, someone who just allows you to feel all of the things that you are feeling and facilitate this space for students to do that for one another. And over the years, some of my strongest connections with students have come from this. And this young woman who had lost her brother, uh, she had been with her high school boyfriend when she got the news. And she called me a couple of years after she graduated and said that she was going to marry the young man that she had been with and would I officiate at the wedding. I was so honored to do so. And it was a small town in um, Washington State and everyone at the wedding had been at the funeral. Mm -hmm. and so the first thing I said is there's no secret here. No one is coming out as a Jew. I'm here <laughs> not because of uh, a connection through a specific religious tradition, but a connection through our shared humanity. And the Psalms text, you turn my mourning into dancing, was the text for the wedding. And the dancing at this wedding was superlative. <laughs> Not only because so many of the students had gone to Stanford and taken the social dance class, which in addition to the happiness class is the most popular class in the university. Thank you very much. Now let's turn to Sensei Joshin. Is that the correct way to frame it? Uh, you've told me you had a hard scrabble upbringing and originally trained in a Roman Catholic seminary as a Dominican brother, uh, what led you there and to where you are now? Hmm. What struck me about all these you know, presentations whenever I talk to chaplains is you realize how this comes out of your own life, you know? It just comes out of your life. And um, yeah, I grew up also in Brooklyn <laughs> and uh, second generation immigrant, Italian, Irish, Roman Catholic family very seriously alcoholic father, kind of working class poor, six kids, lots of children in a two bedroom tenement building, so that experience. 
And um, I uh, was, yeah, as an adolescent, I realized I was gay, and that was a bit isolating in that kind of an environment for me. And so um, this was in the late 70s, and of course, there weren't very mo many positive images of gay people in society at that point. I imagined I would spend my life like singing show tunes on a bar stool somewhere, and that was <laughs> the only image I had of being gay. And um, so I ran to the monastery. <laughs> and um, <laughs> there's a good dating pool there. And, you know, I was, uh, but I uh, gen first entered a Benedictine monastery for two years at 19 years old and developed kind of contemplative practice. Part of it was a running away practice and an inability to kind of take a look at my situation. And then um, things started to shift a little bit and I didn't want to be a cloistered monk. I became a mendicant with a very progressive religious order at that time, the Dominicans, and focused a lot on social justice practice while maintaining contemplative practice. I actually met my partner there in 1982. We're still together. Um, so we were monks together, which is kind of a nice basis for a relationship. Um, and uh, after that, oh, I left in 1986, very, very um, reactive and disheartened with the Catholic Church at that point on a lot of issues. And part of it was my own coming out really that I just realized that wasn't the right environment uh, for me to do that work so I went into academia and about this time the AIDS epidemic was uh, really in um, uh, it was kind of a full forest fire at that point I went to NYU I was in the village I was surrounded by a really really tough situation and I left I was doing a PhD at NYU and I decided at the end to leave the PhD program and go do AIDS work full-time after having been an act-up activist there for a number of years. So I came into kind of, um, um, I would say, secular humanism at that point. I came into kind of an atheist way of showing up in the world, uh, kind, of a, a kind of an anti-religious way, actually, uh, for many years uh, born with the feelings of exclusion uh, and alienation from religious institutions and in an epidemic that felt utterly abandoned by so many in organized religion at that time. So I worked in AIDS for a long time, and then I hit 40 years old and had the proverbial midlife moment. Um, uh, my partner and I had adopted three children from the foster care system who were all deeply traumatized, early childhood trauma. Um, and I was working in the AIDS epidemic, and I kind of hit the wall of burnout. It was just, I was crispy and fried, and there was just nothing left. And I, you know, went through the typical things. I had an affair, I might put my marriage at risk, I uh, found no meaning in what I was doing. It was kind of a classic burnout moment. And um, I went to a Jungian psychologist. Uh, I was living in San Francisco at that point, working at the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. I went to this guy in the Castro, and I was met him one time, and I said this story. I just told him the story. He's like, Okay, he said, I think I, think I got something here. <laughs> he said, I, I think when you left religious life, you kind of threw out the proverbial baby with the bathwater and you lost your inner life. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's time to reclaim that. And that, that like went through me, you know, was like, ah, yeah, that's what this is. And so I was lost. I couldn't go back into Western religion. I had felt I burned that bridge in a way. And I so turned to Eastern practices and eventually through Ashtanga Yoga and a brief kind of period of Hinduism found first um, kind of the Vipassana traditions of Buddhism and then into Zen Buddhism and particularly the Zen peacemaker expression of Zen Buddhism which is a highly socially engaged contemplative engagement with the world. So that's the nutshell. Sorry that was so long. Well there's a lot there and thank you for both of you uh, to give us a little bit of context here. Um, and I think on this theme of resiliency, it's, it is easy to feel depleted and to experience what sometimes at least feels like burnout. Um, and at the same time, chaplains and other spiritual caregivers are called to remain open-hearted to uh, people who are in need and often in distress. 
And so my, my question is, how can you remain open-hearted and truly responsive to those we're caring for uh, without being enveloped by the pain and confusion that they may be in? Either of you. Well, for, for myself, I feel so grateful to have received a religious tradition that provides me not only with guidance, but also with language and with texts and study and community that help to mitigate some of the isolation that I think is a part of that burnout. Um, it's a tremendous gift to have a tradition that has gone through so many moments of darkness and come out through the light. So having, having that as an awareness, I think, is enormously helpful. And then the kinds of practices that come out of it, for me anyway, have been uh, very, very valuable. And I, I call myself a conservative innovator. I often will take something that has been done in a particular way traditionally and will modify it in a way that speaks to me. So I do a morning prayer, but I do it in the pool. Um, I'm a swimmer, <laughs> and I happen to have in my backyard a seven by 14 foot pool, very small, with a current generator. So I literally swim against the current every morning. And it's one of the things that helps me to remember that whatever's going on out there and whatever difficulties I've experienced in a one-on-one -on -one encounter where I've tried to be present for someone struggling, that that current helps to connect me to the heart of the world, the heartbeat of the world. The water is moving. I did my rabbinic thesis on water as a symbol of healing and redemption. And so being literally surrounded by, embraced by, inside the water, um, is one of the ways of renewal for me. And uh, there's, there's the tradition of going to the mikvah. Of, uh, the mikvah is a ritual pool where the uh, natural water and the plumbing water kiss. So that image for me is also a very powerful metaphor about encountering what's artificial and encountering what's natural and trying to find the essence of it. And uh, the mikvah is one of those traditions where you enter with your entire body. You are enveloped and embraced by the water. Why do you think water is so healing? I think partly that we can't live without it. That. Uh, I, actually, Joshin said when he came here that part of what he appreciated coming from a dry climate was feeling the humidity in the air. There's something that is restorative physically <coughs> about water. Boy, and, do we have moisture in yeah, Boston for you. Right. And, and then, of course, spiritually, mayim chayim, living water, is what Torah is called. So teaching is what takes place when you enter that water. So it works on so many different levels. Uh, the, the image that was part of my thesis was uh, uh, the image of the parting of the Red Sea. And there's a number of different stories that are told about that moment. Uh, one is that Nachshon ben Aminadav, who's a little known person in the Torah but becomes a bigger person in the Midrash, is the first person to enter the waves. And, uh, there are three different ways in which this is seen. One is he's aware that the Egyptians are racing behind him, he doesn't know what's going on ahead. He's uh, so gung-ho and so committed to saving the Israelites that he just plunges into the waves. The second midrash is they're completely traumatized. What's behind is dangerous. What's in front of them is dangerous. What are they going to do? They're arguing about how they're going to proceed. Nachshon stumbles and falls his way into the waves. <laughs> and the third, perhaps not surprising for a tradition that has uh, generated so many lawyers, they get into a negotiation with God. You know, what are you going to do with this water? How are you going to handle it? OK, God says, I'll make the waves a wall, and you'll be able to walk through it. 
So for me, the image of Nachshon, the one who enters the waves, has always been a very powerful image. And I think all three play a role in the way that I see it. Sometimes I'm negotiating something that hasn't existed before. Sometimes I'm in a moment that I have absolutely no clue how to deal with and I've stumbled into it and don't really know that I'm gonna come through on the other side. And sometimes I am absolutely certain about what's gonna take place. But for me, what's kind of uh, consistent in all of them is Nachshon didn't see himself as Moses. He didn't see himself as the one who was going to um, create the next uh, path. He creates a kind of, in the words of Franz Rosenzweig, a path through pathlessness. So I, I sometimes feel that as a woman, without there being role models for the kind of leadership that I've tried to do, I'm like Nachshon. I found my way into the waves and somehow have to make it to the other side. Mm -hmm. Well, um, that very image leads me to uh, a question about a trap that uh, many caregivers can fall into that I'd like Joshin to uh, reflect on for us. Uh, the trap of trying to play the role of savior, of crusader, of the Moses figure, um, you know, which may be impossible in some of these difficult circumstances. And so I wonder how the caregiver can redefine what he or she is doing so as not to fall into the role where they feel like they have to be Moses. Hmm. Hmm. Um, of course, Moses isn't the archetype in our tradition. <laughs> so I'm trying to kind of make the leap in some ways. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, my, my main chaplaincy work is street ministry, actually. So I don't work in hospitals um, and institutional settings. I live voluntarily homeless for periods of time in various cities around the country as a bearing witness practice, which then is a kind of contemplative practice that I then bring to a street ministry where we um, do kind of spiritual companionship with folks who are um, unsheltered and of course when you do street practice or street retreat or street sessions or plunges like that one of the impulses I often have at the beginning is how screwed up this world is how victimized these people are how much we have to save them and um, part of that is a bit of a mental model that I think many of us are conditioned to have, which is it's all so broken and I'm here to fix it. And I think part of the contemplative practice allows us to see kind of the, the power of that narrative and its weaknesses in some ways or its limitations. That, uh, you know, what's that famous quote if you, um, all you see is people that need to be fixed, it means you think the world is broken. And is it? I think one of the things that Zen and contemplative and silent contemplative practice do is it allows us to really question these very deep assumptions. And so um, is there actually a world, you know, is there actually saving that needs to be done? Is, I think, something that's really valuable to question. Or are, can we, through a deep sense of solidarity and connection, recognize that we are naturally creative, resourceful, and whole? And can we meet each other there? And in that place of deep solidarity, there's a kind of presencing that can happen that I think um, can heal the parts of us that keep us from that deep and abiding sense of wholeness and res resourcefulness and creativity. Is there a way that you can help somebody who may be in a broken down situation, even if they themselves are not broken, to recognize that they have this underlying wholeness? Yeah, and I think in some ways, you know, um, it was spoken to by Frank, it's that to recognize that your empathy is an important starting place. Like you have to be able to feel into the perspective and the life of that person as a human being who is experiencing pain and suffering. 
and that empathy primes this ability to come beside them and to bear witness to their life so that you are not in your own pain spiral with them, but can feel their pain, come beside their pain, and presence their lives with a kind of loving, calm attention and a kind of authentic responsiveness to them, to really trust the relationship that you're in. And I think that then, in that process, we're allowed to kind of let go of role in this. Even though you carry with you all of your skills and your experience, what you learned in school, what you've learned from life, all of that comes to the table. But what is first and foremost is relationship. In Zen, we say it's you know, not one, not two. In other words, you are beside them and you are one with them both. And you hold that perspective and engage authentically. And to do that, you have to do your own work. You have to not kind of bite the hook of your own unprocessed suffering, discomfort, mental uh, conditions that keep you from being able to stand really beside someone and give them your full presence and attention. And are those unprocessed feelings triggered when you Absol enter into Absolutely. companioning with somebody on the street? Yeah, in, for street ministry, for me, you know, I came to that because my father, who I mentioned, was a serious alcoholic. My mother died very, very young, and my father became homeless in Manhattan and abandoned the family for years. And we had to wind up raising young children who were still there, and it was very, very difficult and traumatic. So one of the reasons I started doing street ministry was when when my father was dying finally in his mid-80s, after smoking six packs a day and you know, drinking a lot, you think, wow, I hope I have that gene, part of that gene pool. Um, but you know, I had enormous unresolved rage, shame, anger, all of these things that were just hanging out there and really in the way for me to be able to let go of my fixed ideas about that kind of suffering or that kind of situation in life. And, um, and, it is, and in my early street work, it was very triggered. I'd see my father everywhere. I'd be in the Bowery and I'd say, oh, there he is, you know? Or I'd see this person being outraged over there and I'd be like, I'm not going there, you know, because um, I know that dynamic. You know, I'd be reliving these things, but in that same time, using that experience to untie my own knots, to untangle, to loosen it up a little bit, uh, to not grip it all so firmly, to recognize that my, my mind's um, habit is to tell a story about what's going on that is conditioned by my life experience. It is not the whole picture. There's more here than that. And so the contemplative practice is about, for me, about kind of relaxing that a little bit and being able to take a wider perspective that is both imbued with a kind of solidarity or empathy or oneness with the person, but also feels into the larger situation, the whole situation that's there, um, both as a participant and as an observer. You know. And for you, and I'll ask this of both of you, what revitalizing practices do you find uh, replenish you and allow you to go on and to do it in the right spirit so that you're feeling connected and loving rather than struggling to cover up how difficult it is? Rabbi? Hearing Joshin talk about his parents, um, I. I was raised at a time where feminist women were often, if not ashamed of their mothers, at least did not find their mothers to be role models. One of the things that my mother taught me was to knit. Knitting is part of my spiritual practice. And I mentioned that my parents died when I was young. My, my mother died. I was trying to figure out an appropriate way to honor her. And 
I came up with the concept of knitting every morning and then say mourner's cottage. And so I did that for 11 months. I, uh, I knit a baby bunting. I was not pregnant when I started. I became pregnant when I was in the process of knitting. And each morning I would knit and I would reflect on her life. And it created literally a knitting together of disparate parts of my upbringing, such that I came to appreciate that while she could not have been a role model for me on a professional trajectory, she was an amazing friend. And being a friend then became a significant part of her legacy. So I now, and I should say that I knit this baby bunting, which I gave to my daughter, uh, who was born just after my father died. So hmm. the day I finished St. Cottage for my mother, my father died. Um, and I have recently knit that same bunting again for my granddaughter. So part of the practice of knitting for people is, uh, in my mind, both a traditional Jewish practice and, a tradi and an innovative practice simultaneously. So that's a big piece of it. Prayer, as I mentioned before, uh, and relates a little bit to, to what Joshin was saying about connection. The, um, the prayers that I start with um, are those that are about our soul being renewed to us, us each day. But the second prayer that I do always is, Hareini mikabel alai mitzvat aseh, shalviya hafta lereacha kamocha, vahareini mishtadel laho kol adam v'chaba, v'chol nafshi v'v'chol me'odi. Behold, I take upon myself the obligation to love my neighbor as myself, and behold, I will strive to love each man and each woman with all of my heart and with all of my being. So that practice is one that helps to take even people that I'm struggling with and to remember that we are connected in a very essential and unbroken way. And, and in thinking about that brokenness of the world, uh, one of my uh, friends and colleagues, Margaret Holub, talks about the inclination to repair the world because of what she calls nefesh chaya, the, uh, the kind of animal life-giving connections between all of us, the spirit that is about creativity and birth and opportunity and potential. And that I think if we see ourselves always as facing the brokenness, then we're all about what's disparate. And if we see ourselves as being knit together, then it's possible to see that life-giving quality all around us and to help other people to mirror it. So, so that's another piece of my practice. And the study is a very important part for me. So um, Judaism is a tradition where the way we know what God wants of us is through reading and interpreting text, and reading and interpreting text in community. So, uh, so those all become bound together. Knit together. Knitted together, yes. And the, the Hebrew word for tractate, like the tractate of a Talmud, is maseket, which is the same Hebrew word as knit. Very nice. What helps to replenish and revitalize you? Um, Are you a knitter? I am, actually. Okay. <laughs> I, I am. I knit prayer shawls, too, uh, and little hats, and I give them away. It's fun. Um, and that certainly is replenishing. I think there are a few things. One is, um, you know, obviously I've chosen a contemplative path. Uh, 
And so I think the contemplative practice has a lot to offer in, um, in some ways, not just replenishing and restoring, but actually in some ways uh, preventing depletion by being able to observe and not be driven by your ego-driven reactions and needs. Um, to, to be able to see them, to stabilize one's attention enough to be able to see the onslaught of um, those reactions, thoughts, and mental formations, of learning to um, liberate them, to see them, what we would say in Zen, as empty, uh, which is that they are conditioned, you know, um, that they're not the whole picture again, and therefore find some space around them. And then also in the contemplative practice to stabilize one's attention enough to open up one's field of awareness to recognize that you are not independent in this world, that we awaken together, and, um, and that there is an innate and natural solidarity that exists and to find your home in that natural solidarity I think is one of the benefits of contemplative practice and that home is a place that is naturally <laughs> resilient and well resourced I think in my experience so what what that evokes for me is the power of Shabbat mm -hmm. that um, there what evo that evokes for me is the power of Shabbat, that um, there is an understanding of, of the Sabbath as the pause that restores, the palace and time, the sense of it encountering and experiencing the world to come in this world. And so once you have that, um, once you can enter into that reality, you can bring it with you into the week. Um, you know, we, we often have an understanding of being, trying to be present for everyone. I have a bumper sticker that says, I'm here for you 24-6. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think sometimes it's important, really as, you know, Frank's story about receiving the text message. You need that pause, you need that Shabbat yeah. to be able to go back into the world. I, I might add maybe, can I just add one, one or two more things? Um, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll do a little Zen quote for you that I think is a very powerful practice in some ways. It's a, it's a um, kind of sequence of things. Dogen, the 13th century founder of this particular lineage of Zen Buddhism, wrote in a great um, um, fascicle of his great work called the Genjo Koan. He says, you know, to study the way, to study the path, is to study the self. First of all, we have to know who we are, what conditions you, what is it that you think you are. You have to know that. And in studying the self is to forget the self, is you recognize that it's a conditioned view. What you think you are, what you think you are, is a story in a way, a powerful story, a necessary one, one that shouldn't be devalued, but it also shouldn't be the only way that you live your life, that you recognize that this is your conditioned experience. So, he says, to forget the self then, so to, to study the self is to forget the self, to recognize it doesn't really exist. And to forget the self then is to be penetrated by everything. So, who are you, really? And he says, and to be penetrated by everything, your own body and mind and the body and mind of all other things fall away. Again, back to that deep sense of solidarity, this kind of home base that we uncover when we really sit in contemplative practice uh, with what's really going on up here. And what we're usually going on is we are reifying narratives that actually separate us from this sense of solidarity. We are objectifying rather than living in subjectivity. And we have to objectify, you have to be able to know as you cross the street, that's a bus and this is me. <laughs> you have to be able to do that. But we do it um, in a way, we say upaya actually means skillful means. So you do it in a way skillfully. You're bringing a deep awareness 
of this to your activity in life. And so contemplative practices and ritual practice actually are all ways that can um, help you practice, I think, uh, with that process. And it doesn't have to be deeply heady. It's actually a felt sense that one can access very quickly as one is opening the door of a hospital into a room or pulling back a curtain or walking into a prison cell or uh, a shelter, that there are ways to quickly access it. And I could just guide you to Roshi Joan, who's my teacher's work on what she calls the grace model for this, which is a mnemonic for five practices that are linked together. And it's designed for people who are working in high-paced, high-stress situations to quickly kind of drop through those things that Dogen talks about, to ground oneself in the situation, to open one's heart, to attune to the situation that one is in, and then to end it, which is the other part, which is part of the restorative process, I think, to be able to know how to close these encounters in a way where you recognize you have done your best and uh, you are in a constant process, you know, but to, to bring an end to the situation is an important part of the story. Is that part difficult? Ending? Yeah, I think especially for those of us who are pathological altruists, you know. Um, yeah, it's hard to let go of that, you know. And it's important, and I would say our pathological altruism undermines our altruism often. So we have a responsibility, I think, to not feed the pathology of caregiving but in fact to be able to know you, that you are not one and you are not two. Like, how do you really practice with that in very concrete ways? And so that you are not stuck in empathetic over-arousal, as Frank talked about this morning, and therefore lost in a kind of moral distress. Like, that will undermine our ability to care. In fact, that's not care. That's working out your own stuff on a patient or a client. And that's really important to recognize when that's a temptation for you. And I think the contemplative practices are ones that help you get some distance so you can see what's actually going on in your own mind, in your own body, and be able to liberate it so that you can be present. I'd like to ask about a, a different area, which is intrinsic to all of the work that you all are describing and that you are trying to embody. And that is the profound act of listening. And I wonder if you can describe how you see the dynamics of truly compassionately listening to another human being uh, in a way that can be healing. Maybe we can start with you in just a few minutes. I think the image of holding someone's eyes, of helping to be seen, uh, is such a powerful piece of what it means to hear. And uh, again, I, my new identity as a grandmother is such a uh, significant piece of how I think about listening. You listen to different cries. You have a sense of physically holding a baby, but I think that we can transport that to holding someone's <coughs> story. Uh, so much of the time, we don't feel seen. We don't feel heard. And I, I don't know exactly how one trains to do this. I think it has to do with megalopsychia, with open-heartedness, with, um, with being willing to, to make that distinction between what's one's stuff and what's being offered. Uh, yeah, I, I, somehow just the image of a baby is a very... The, the way in which we attend to the needs of a newborn who can't possibly manage without other uh, assistance, if we can bring that care, that attention, that presence, that 
appreciation, that sense of mystery and awe and genuine care. Maybe there's something in the way that God treats us that is analogous. Joshin? Yeah, um, all of that, another um, perspective uh, too, which is listening itself maybe isn't the thing that heals, but you know, in, from a Buddhist framework, um, everything is imbued with Buddha nature, as I mentioned this morning, this kind of natural wholeness, natural innate wholeness. Our listening, I think, can create opportunities for people to access what is whole within them. It kind of allows something to um, emerge out of the haze of confusion, a kind of clarity and um, allows people to access what we might say is their inner teacher. Um, and I think, so maybe it's a little bit more like listening as, as though you're midwifing. Um, listening as though you're watching something emerge from deep within the womb. And that is co coming about through a very natural process. Um, not always an easy one. That maybe that's what our listening allows for. I also think a little bit about, you know, Tom Smerton, Christian and Zen practitioner at the end of his life who talked about contemplative practice as listening with one's whole body into the mind of God. And in Zen, we often say, you don't listen with your ears, you listen with your eyes and you see with your ears. So can we open up our, what we think of even as hearing into a kind of full and whole presencing that involves both your own wholeness and the wholeness of the one you're encountering and listening to. And that, I think, allows for something transformative to happen both in both the listener and the one being spoken to and or being listened to, the one speaking. And that, I think, is transformative, and I trust that a lot in encounters, um, in those moments where people are going through really serious things in life. I trust that deep sense of connection. Well, I love your moment of synesthesia there. Um, we have reached the pumpkin hour for this session. Uh, let me thank very wholeheartedly Rabbi Patricia Carlin Newman and Sensei Joshin Burns for traveling from the West to be with us today and to help to enlighten us. I get to be a little bit of a, a traffic um, director, but before I do that, I want to also thank David for um, leading us through a really fascinating conversation. And um, I just have to sort of say a little bit about my um, deep appreciation for both um, Sensei Joshin and Rabbi Patricia Carlin Newman. And um, I also am a knitter. Um, and. Uh, Patty is one of my best friends in life. I picked her up at the airport last night. We, we drove um, to the restaurant um, talking about knitting almost the entire way. And um, one of the things we talked about is how when you are a knitter, and this is true for the many different arts that all of you engage in, you don't do it alone. Always in the movies, they show knitters alone, you know, some old lady sitting by herself knitting. And that's not how it's done because we all mess up. Knitters all mess up. We make lots of mistakes. In fact, she told me in great detail about a mistake she had just made. She had to, you know, unravel 40 rows of, of something she's doing. And then we help each other. That's what knitters do. 
And that's what you do as chaplains, and that's kind of the theme of the conference as well. And both of you have helped me. I've only known Sensei Joshin for about a year, um, but he offered radical hospitality to a group of us looking at Buddhist ministry at Upaya, and this is a big part of who he is as well as what Upaya is. A person with such a generous heart, he's very hospitable. And I have um, taken... Um, naps against my will during Sabbath at uh, Rabbi <laughs> Patty's house because I don't nap unless I'm there and in the spirit of Sabbath it it embraces me into a, a relaxation. So um, we are glad you're here, here and have offered us the hospitality of your insights. Mm -hmm.